Hey everybody, this is Russell Metro Game Core. Today we are going to do a starter guide on the Retroid Pocket 4 and 4 Pro. Now, this is going to also apply to other Retroid devices. So if you have the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or the Retroid Pocket Flip, or maybe even the Retroid Pocket 2S, all of these Retroid doohickeys are going to work with this guide. Essentially, these are all Android-based devices, and so the process is going to be similar. It's just going to be a matter of whether or not certain emulators are going to work better on the chip. So in this video, I'm going to take you all the way from the very beginning, so talking about how to set up this device and what kind of equipment you would need, to the very end where we're going to actually configure each of these emulators and then also set up a front end just to make it look like a nice and seamless experience. Anyway, we've got a lot of ground to cover, so grab a snack and drink and let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, as we get started here, one of the first things I like to mention is that I always make a written guide to accompany these video guides. So just go over to RetroGameCore.com and you will find the Retroid Pocket Guide right here. And this will be handy for a couple reasons. Number one, I can update the written guide as time marches on, but then also you can access this website from the browser on your Retroid Pocket device, which means that you can click directly on any sort of links that I have in my guide. And that's going to come in handy, especially when we're trying to install certain apps and emulators directly onto the device. Anyway, as always, Ways, I'll have this link down in the video description below if you want to check it out. Now in this starter guide we're going to go through six major steps and I'll walk you through each of these one at a time. But bear in mind that because there's so much information here I'm going to go pretty fast through this whole guide. And so even though this is going to be a long video, probably over an hour, I'll have everything time stamped down below. So if you want to jump into any certain section you can just do that. And then also you can use that written guide as kind of a side accompaniment. So let's start by talking about recommended equipment and accessories for the Retroid Pocket device. Now, there's not a ton of these, really just the major thing is going to be an SD card. Because we're going to be focusing on the Retroid Pocket 4 and 4 Pro in this video, I do recommend getting a rather large card, just because some of those more updated systems like PS2 and GameCube, they have large file sizes. So at a bare minimum, I think that a 256 gigabyte card is going to give you plenty of space to put all your favorite games on there. And if you're more of a collector, you want to make sure you have access to like a ton of games, you're going on a long trip, then maybe 512 gigabytes might suit you better. And I do have recommendations for specific specific cards, which I'll leave linked in the video description, as well as that written guide. Now, if your computer doesn't have an SD card reader, then I would recommend getting one of these, which is a USB reader. And you have a couple different options. This one here from Anchor is about $12, $15, and I've had it for years. It has been really reliable. However, recently I did upgrade to a different one. It's also from the same company, Anchor, but this one has USB-C and USB-A ports. So I found that to be pretty handy to be able to plug directly into other devices and then also into a computer. And I would say these are the most important accessories, at least when it comes to getting started. So let's move into the first step of our process, which is going to be to set up the Android section of the device first. When you first boot up your device, you'll be greeted with a welcome screen. This will be the same across any Retroid device. And the setup here is going to be very similar to like setting up a new phone. So you're going to pick your language, you can then connect to the internet, set your time zone. But there are a couple things that are unique. The first is going to be the ability to turn off Google Play services. What this means is that you won't have the Play Store or any of that other other stuff on your device at all. So if you're trying to stay off the grid with your retro handheld, you know, you don't want the man like looking at your stuff, then you can totally do that. It's also going to free up some of the background processes on the device, so it might make some emulators work better. However, in general, I would just recommend keeping Google Play services on because that does give you access to the Play Store to be able to download emulators. It's going to make things a lot easier. And there are also certain apps that just won't work without Google Play services installed, for example, some streaming apps. So in the end, I do recommend enabling Google Play Play services unless you have a specific reason to turn these off. Now another thing that Retroid does is they allow you to pre-install specific apps. However, you can find all these apps pretty easily, either on the Google Play Store or just on an individual website. And the apps that are preloaded on the Retroid devices are going to be a lot older than the ones that you can find online. So personally, I recommend skipping all of these, except for one if you have an older Retroid device, like the 3 Plus or the 2 Plus. For those, I would recommend downloading this Dolphin for Handheld app. This is a fork of the official Dolphin from a while back, but it's been tuned perfectly for really good performance. So if you have weaker hardware and you really want to make sure you play your favorite GameCube game, this one might be a great solution. Anyway, if you have a Retro Pocket 4 or 4 Pro, I don't think you're going to need this one at all, so we're just going to skip it. Okay, and then on the last page, you're going to have an option between choosing between the built-in launcher and then the AOSP launcher, which is going to be a standard version of Android. Now, the Retroid launcher isn't terrible. It's pretty snappy and allows you to launch your emulated game, 
games, but there are some limitations in what emulators will work with it. And so as a result, we're going to use the AOSP launcher, which will just give us a blank slate when it comes to an Android device. And then we're going to set up our own third party launcher or front end. So for this section, I recommend selecting AOSP launcher and then we are good to go. It's going to say configuration complete and then we can press start and it'll be greeted with our new home screen. Now, the first thing we want to do is go into the settings and make some configurations within Android. But before we do that, I actually recommend that you restart the device right now. And that's because some settings won't appear until you restart the device at least one time. So press down on the power button until you see this menu, then select restart. And then after a minute, you'll be back in this menu. Now we can press on that settings cog wheel and make some adjustments. First thing we want to do is scroll all the way down until we find the system section. Tap on that and then go into the updater section. And this is where we're going to update the Retroid Pocket software. All you have to do is just tap on that button that says check update. And and if there is an update, it'll let you know. Mine came with the latest software, so we have nothing to do at this point. Next, we're going to press the back button a couple times until we get to the main settings menu. Now near the top, you'll see a section that says notifications. Within here, you'll find an option that says do not disturb. Tap on that and then turn this on. This means that all those random apps that we're going to install are not going to give us notifications while we're trying to play a game. From there, go back to the main settings menu and now go into display. Within here, you'll find a section that says screen timeout. By default, it's going to be set to one minute. And I recommend that you change this to 30 minutes. And that's because if you just walk away for a second, when you come back, your screen's going to be turned off and that can be pretty annoying. So I keep it at 30 minutes and then I just turn off the screen myself by tapping on the power button. Next, we're going to go down to the security section within the main menu. And here there's a section called screen lock. And by default, it's going to be set to swipe. That means that every time you wake up or turn on the device, you'll have to swipe up to actually get to the menu. And I personally don't find that to be necessary with a gaming device, and so I just set this to none. That way, when I press the power button, I'll be instantly into the main menu. Finally, in the main menu, we have one more section to look into, which is called the handheld settings menu. And these are settings specific to the Retroid Pocket devices. There's quite a few things that you can do in here, so I recommend going through each and then learning about what you can change. For example, under the vibrator section, you can change the amount of rumble. It's set to medium by default. Another handy section is the input section. Here, under input control, you can do all sorts of things like testing out your gamepad and making sure that everything's nice and calibrated. Another important section within the input menu is the controller style. And you have two options between Xbox and Retro, and by default, it'll be set to Retro. Now each of these correspond to a different ABXY layout with the face buttons. If you look here on the right, you can see that the ABXY on the Nintendo Switch side is going to be A on the right side. And this is what the buttons look like on the Retroid Pocket devices as well. And if you've ever used a Nintendo device, you know that by pressing that A button on the right side, that's like your confirm button. Then the B button on the bottom is going to be your cancel button. And so if you keep it on the retro setting by default, that's how the map layout is going to be. The issue is that many Android apps, including Android games, Games are not configured with this kind of layout. Instead, they have the Xbox layout. And as you can see on the left side, the A button, which is known as the confirm button, is going to be on the bottom, and then the B button is on the right. And this is the button layout that most apps and games are going to expect. So for me personally, I recommend using the Xbox controller style, and then when there is a specific app that could use the retro one, for example, the Yuzu emulator, then we can change that out. And in this video, I'll show you a really quick way that you can change those as well. Anyway, after that, I recommend going into the L2 R2 mode and making sure this is set to both. That's going to give you the best compatibility with both analog and digital inputs. Other than that, the other handheld settings section worth noting is the advanced section. Here you can go through the setup wizard that we did at the beginning of the video, and you can also do a factory reset. This will be great if you want to start over from scratch or you're going to be selling your device. Okay, so we've got everything configured for the main settings menu, but there are a couple other things we can check out. The first is going to be our top down slide menu. So what you're going to do is put your finger near the top of the screen and then slide it down. This is exactly how an Android tablet or phone will work as well. Within here, we've got a few options. The first I want to talk about is the performance section. Here we can adjust between standard, performance, and high performance. And this will really depend on which emulator and game that you're trying to run. But I would say for most systems, you're going to want to keep it on the standard mode. However, when it comes to the higher end systems, things like GameCube, PS2, and Nintendo Switch, those I do recommend setting to high performance if you're having any sort of performance issues on the standard mode. 
code. And so you'll have to mess around with this. If you're getting any sort of slowdown, then I would recommend increasing the performance profile. Now to the right of that, we have the ability to change the different fan profiles. However, there's a weird bug that's happening in the software right now. Because I'm using video out through the USB-C port, it just keeps it on the sport or the highest fan mode. So unfortunately, I'm not able to swap these around to show you the other ones, but we have one called smart and then one called quiet. And I would recommend adjusting these depending on the performance profile that you're using. Now, if we swipe over to the right side, we'll see another set of tiles. And one unique one is called floating icon. And this is a special quick menu that'll start when you're running a game. To see this, all you have to do is slide from the right towards the left. And you'll get a bunch of different options here. And to be honest, not many of these are going to be very useful. However, if you're playing an Android game that doesn't have built-in controller support, you can use their key mapper function. Here you can assign buttons or analog stick directions anywhere you want on the screen. And so you'll put the button wherever you're supposed to touch the screen and it's going to work that same way. And so that might be handy depending on whether or not you're going to be playing a bunch of Android games. Other than that, the only other two functions I've really used in this section have been the ability to make a screenshot and then also do a screen recording. And so honestly, I just don't really use the floating icon that much. And so what I often will do is just go into this menu and then tap it to turn it off. And that, of course, is going to be a matter of preference. Another thing worth noting, if you want to change out these tiles, then all you have to do is press this little pencil icon on the right, and then you'll see all the tiles, and you can rearrange these or move them off or even add others that are down on the bottom. And so that's about it when it comes to the Android setup with your Retroid Pocket device. Okay, I'm going to jump in here real quick. So as we move forward and we're talking about installing and configuring emulators, I'm actually going to use footage from a previous video. I made the Odin 2 starter guide about two months ago at this point. It's a really long video and in depth. It's actually over an hour long and it took me over a week to put it all together. Now, a lot of that process is going to be very similar on the Retroid Pocket 4 and 4 Pro. So I'm just going to reuse that footage for those parts that are exactly the same. You might see some little differences, like I might say Odin 2 on the screen instead of Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Pro, but I bet you are smart enough to figure out the difference between the two. Anyway, I just wanted to put that out there and I will jump in from time to time when needed just to make any sort of distinction about the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, but either way, let's go ahead and jump in. So now let's go ahead and start installing some apps. We're going to start with those that are available already on the Google Play Store. And this part is very similar to how it'd be like setting up a new phone or a tablet. So we're going to go into the Play Store. You're going to sign in with your Google account and then you'll use the Play Store interface to download new apps. So here are the ones that I recommend. We're going to start in alphabetical order here and work our way across. To start, we're going to talk about emulators. And the ones I recommend from the Google Play Store are those that are basically stable. That means they work really well and they don't get a ton of upgrades all the time. And so we don't have to worry about getting the latest and greatest. So we'll start with the Drastic emulator. This one is a Nintendo DS emulator and is easily the best one available. However, bear in mind, it's not a free app. It actually costs $5. In fact, many of the apps I'm going to be recommending in this section are probably going to be paid. There are free versions of some of these, and so I'll make a note of that as well. Anyway, that's the first one I recommend. Next up is going to be Duck Station. This is a PS1 emulator. And this one works great, and it's totally free, so no issue there. Up next, we have the Moopin 64 Plus FZ emulator. And this one plays Nintendo 64 games, and there is a free and pro version. And the free one does work fine, but it has ads. If you want to get rid of those ads and get a couple extra features, it'll cost you $3.99. Up next in our alphabetical list is going to be the PSP emulator called PPSSPP. And this one has a free and paid version. The paid one is called gold. Now there is no feature difference between the two. The gold one is literally there just to help support the developer. And if you want to throw a few dollars his way, it's going to be five bucks. Also, one thing of note is that once you buy any of these apps, it's going to be associated with your Google account. And so any other future device that you use with that Google account will be able to download these for free. So these are all going to be a one-time purchase across Android writ large. Okay, up next we have Redream. This is a Dreamcast emulator. Now this one is also free, but it does have in-app purchases if you want to unlock some features. And this upgrade I do recommend because it will allow you to upscale your resolution. Anyway, the price to upgrade is going to be $5.99 within the app. Okay, up next we have the Yabasan Shiro 2 emulator. This is going to be for Sega Saturn. There's a free and pro version. And the free version has ads and the pro one doesn't. And the pro version will cost you $5.60. I know it looks like a weird number, but you have to remember this developer is in Japan, and so they probably have it set to a specific yen amount. Now, chances are you're not going to use the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro just for emulation. You're probably going to use it for game streaming too. So let me go over a couple of my recommendations here. We'll start with Xbox. Number one, you could just use the Xbox app. This will allow you to use remote play to be able to play on your Xbox series or Xbox One directly on your Odin. 
And this one, of course, is made by Microsoft and it's completely free. However, there is a third party one called XBX Play. This one is not free, it costs $5.99. However, I found the connection to be a lot better than on the Microsoft app, and it also allows you to use the full 1080p resolution, unlike the other one, which does 720p. And then finally, on the official app, you cannot remote play Xbox 360 games, but you can on this one. So if all those features appeal to you, it might be worth the $5.99 for this app. Now, if you don't have an Xbox, but you still want to play Xbox games, then I would recommend getting Xbox Game Pass. Now, Game Pass is a paid subscription, but it will allow you to stream games directly from the cloud. So this is a great way to play Xbox and PC games without having to own an Xbox or a PC. Next, we're going to talk about PlayStation Remote Play. Now, you cannot use the official app because it doesn't work with the controls on the Odin, but there are two different third-party apps available. The first one is called Chiaki. This one's a little bit clunky, but totally free. However, the setup process for this is not very intuitive, and so it can be a pain. Meanwhile, there's another third-party app that I like using called PS Play. This is from the same maker of the XBX Play app that we were just looking at. Now, this one is also paid. It's $5.99, but the setup process is super simple, and it'll use the controls on the retro. So this is the one that I actually use myself. Okay, next let's talk about streaming games from your PC, and you've got a couple options here. The first is going to be Steam Link, so if you have any computer that's running Steam, you'll be able to log into it and then stream from that one. Another option that's pretty good is called Parsec. This will install an app on your computer, and then you can basically remote into your computer to play games or do other things. Another PC streaming app is going to be Moonlight. This one works great as well. And then finally, we have NVIDIA's GeForce Now Cloud Gaming app. And this one's unique, it doesn't require you to have an actual PC, it will stream it from the cloud. Not only that, if you link it up with your Steam profile, you'll be able to stream your own Steam games. And this one has a free tier and then also other paid ones if you want to have like more time or faster head of line privileges. Okay, and the last set of apps that we're going to talk about here in the Play Store are going to be our front-end apps. The one we're mainly going to use in this video is called Digishow. This is a free front-end, and I'll show you how to configure this one at the end of this video. Now, we also have other front-end application options. For example, one called Beacon Game Launcher just recently came out, and this is pretty good. However, bear in mind this one is not free. It is $2.99 for that initial purchase. And another front-end I think is really great is called the Reset Collection. This one is also not free. It's $4.99, but this one is constantly being updated. Okay, so now that we've gone over a bunch of different emulator and other apps, apps that you can get directly from the Play Store, let's talk about those that you're actually going to install yourself. And this will be done through a process called sideloading. Now that might sound intimidating, but it's actually super simple. All that really means is you're going to download the app and then install it yourself. Now there are many different ways that we can sideload apps onto our device, but we're going to highlight two methods in particular. The first method is just to go to RetroGameCore.com, then click on my starter guide, and then within the table of contents there will be a section called Install Emulators and Other Apps. And if you click on that, there's going to be a whole section that's going to say not in the Google Play Store, and you can just click on these and it'll go directly to where you want to download them. And I'll do that for a few of these here later in this video, but before that, we're actually going to test out a new feature, and this is an app called Obtanium. And this app is awesome because it automates the whole installation and update process of your sideloaded apps. And it just so happens that some of the best emulators for the Retroid Pocket devices are the ones that you should be sideloading. So what we're going to do for the next few minutes is set up Obtanium to really streamline that process for certain apps. And as you can imagine, this section will also be in my written guide. So you're going to go to that written guide, and then under the updating your app section of the guide, there's going to be a link to Obtanium. Go ahead and tap on that, it'll take you to their GitHub page. Here we want to just scroll down a little bit in your browser and then get to the section that says releases on the right. Click on that and then find the most recent release. Then scroll down until you find the one that says ARM64 release.apk. Go ahead and tap on that and it's going to start the download process. You might get a warning about saying that it's something that's harmful, just go ahead and ignore that. Once it's downloaded, it's going to ask you to open it, go ahead and click on that. And after that, it's going to say you're not allowed to actually install apps from Chrome, so you have to go into these settings, and then you'll see a toggle that says allow from this source. Once you turn that on, it's going to start the installation process. You'll then get a window that says the app is installed. Next, we're going to tap on the done button, and we're going to go back into the Chrome browser. And then again, in my guide, you'll see a section that talks about a handy update script. We're going to tap on that link to take us to a different GitHub page, and this is going to be a specific file that's going to work with Obtanium. On the right side, you'll see a little button that says raw. Just go ahead and long press on that, 
and then scroll down until you find the section that says download link. This will take a second and it'll let you know that it's downloaded. And now we're ready to set up Obtanium. So we're going to go back to the Retroid Pocket 4 homepage and you should now see the Obtanium app. We're going to click on that. It's going to ask us about notifications. You can hit allow or don't allow. It doesn't really matter. And then on the bottom, you'll see a button that says import or export. Tap on that and then select the Obtanium import button. From there, it's going to open up the files app and then find the JSON file that we just downloaded a moment ago. Once you tap on that, it's going to say that it imported seven apps. Now, if we go over to the apps button on the left side, you're going to see a list of a bunch of different emulators and apps that are going to be really handy for our setup. And so let me show you how this works. We're going to start with the Citra or 3DS emulator. All we have to do is just tap on that. And then on the bottom, you'll see a little button that says install. Once we tap on that, it's going to download the latest version of the Citra emulator. And once the download is complete, it's going to ask you to install unknown apps from the source. Again, we'll toggle this on and then it'll ask us, do we want to install it? We're going to click, yeah, man, I want to do it. And that's it. We have now installed Citra on our device. Let's do another one just to make sure we've got it down. So we're going to do Dolphin next. Same thing, we're going to press that install button. It's going to ask, do we really want to install it? We're going to say, yeah, man, I want to do it. And that's it. I would just recommend going through each of these in a line and then installing them. Even the one that says Odin Tools is actually really handy for the Retroid Pocket 4 and 4 Pro. So I would recommend installing this one. We'll talk about it later in this video as well. Now, there is one app that I don't really recommend installing on the Retroid Pocket 4 or 4 Pro, and that is going to be the Vita 3K emulator. Unfortunately, when it comes to PS Vita emulation, this chipset just doesn't work really well with it, at least right now. And there's a lot of reasons for it, including some graphics drivers issues, but in the end, I've just never really found it to be worth it on these devices. There are a couple games that will play on it, so if you do want to try it out, you can also install it this way as well. And then also, I would recommend installing the Yuzu emulator from this source as well. This comes directly from GitHub and is updated almost every single day. There are some Play Store versions of the same app, and those are a little bit more stable, but I found that this one usually will give you the best performance. So that's what I would recommend for the Retroid Pocket 4 and 4 Pro. Okay, so that's how you automate the sideloading process for specific apps. However, there are some that you still will have to sideload yourself. And then I also want to go through the process of installing all those other ones that we just installed manually. And so we're going to cover that just in case you don't want to use Obtanium and you want to do it yourself. And so even though you saw me install some of these through Obtanium, let's do them manually as well. We're going to start with RetroArch. For this one, you want to go to the download section and then scroll all the way down until we find the section that is called Nightly Builds. From there, it'll take us to this page and under the Nightly section, we want to click on Android and then we want to scroll down to the second to last option. It's going to be called RetroArch Arch64.apk. Once you find that, go ahead and tap on it and it'll start the download process. Let's do the next one. This is going to be Dolphin for GameCube and Wii. On this one, we're going to go to the download page and then there's the beta versions, but we want to scroll a little bit more down to the development versions. And these ones are updated multiple times a day. From here, just tap on that Android button and then let it download. And you can imagine we're just going to now install it. So that's super simple as well. Next up, we're going to do Citra for Nintendo 3DS. Again, we'll go to the download section and then under the Google Play Store option, there's a manual download. From here, scroll down until you get to the Canary Build section. And this is usually updated at least once a day. Now tap on the little Android guy and it'll start to download your file. And next we have the Yuzu emulator. Like I mentioned, this one is also hosted on GitHub. And it's going to be the same general process where you're going to go over to the releases tab on the right and then you'll tap on that and then download the latest APK. And as you can see, this one's only from a couple hours ago. Okay, next up, we're going to install Aether SX2, which is the PlayStation 2 emulator. Now, if we go to the Aether SX2 website, you can see that the app is no longer in development, but they do maintain an archive of their app. So we're going to click on that archive link, then go down to Android and then Alpha, and we're going to download this file, version 1.54248. Now, there's another version of this app called version 1.53668, and this one you can find on archive.org. Now this is going to be a little bit tricky because I just showed you how to download two different versions of Aether SX2. And the reason why I'm showing both of these is because the performance can vary between the two. When we get to the PlayStation 2 section later in this video, I will talk more about this in depth. For now, I would just recommend downloading both of them and then you can choose which one you want to use when we get to that section of the video. And another emulator you can find on archive.org is called Skyline. And this is a Nintendo Switch emulator that stopped its development about six months ago. However, it still works pretty good with certain games. So we are going to download it just in case. And same thing here, we're going to go down to the show all section and then click on the all versions. And then you can see all the different versions of Skyline Edge. The very last release was called Skyline Edge 69. So that's what we're going to download. 
Okay, so that's it when it comes to the sideloaded apps. Now we're going to talk about the Odin Tools app. That's the one we downloaded as part of the whole Obtainium process. And like I mentioned before, this one is not made for the Retroid Pocket 4 or 4 Pro, but it still works. In fact, when you start it up, it's going to give you a warning. It says, hey, this is made for the Odin 2. Are you sure you want to use it? And I've been testing it for the past week or two, and I've had no issues with it whatsoever. But if you don't want to run the risk, then I totally understand, and you can skip this section. Or if you want, you can just watch this section and see whether or not it's going to be worth it for you. Now, the first thing I like about it is the fact that we have app overrides. If we tap on this and then tap on the Add App Override button, it'll give us a list of all the apps that are installed. Let's use Yuzu as an example. Now when we tap on that, we have the ability to change a couple different features. And like I mentioned earlier, this is an app that works best when you don't use the Xbox style input. So we're going to tap on the one that says Odin. I recognize that this is not an Odin device, but it's still going to work. Additionally, I found this one to work the best in L2 and R2 mode that is set to digital instead of both. Finally, you can also change out the performance mode. So with Yuzu, it usually requires the highest performance, so I'm going to change that to high performance as well. Now when I press save, that means that anytime I open up the Yuzu app, all of these settings are just going to be configured as soon as I start it up. So that means we don't have to go through and change the controller style every time. Let's do another one with Dolphin as our example. This one, we don't have to change out the controller style or the L2 and R2 mode, but we should change out the performance mode. This one works best in high performance. So I'm going to set that and then save it. And now every time we start up Dolphin, it's going to be in high performance mode as well. There are also two other options that are really handy in Odin tools right now. The first is that you can turn on whether or not it's going to be a single press for the home button. And that'll be handy instead of having to press that button twice to get to the home screen. Another thing you could do is adjust the display saturation on the fly. By default, it's going to be set to 1.0, but you can change it to whatever you would like. For example, if we set it to 0.0, .0 as you can see, when I go back into the menu, it's going to be black and white. Personally, I enjoy 1.1. This is going to improve the saturation a little bit without degrading the whole color mode that much. And of course, it's totally subjective, but it's pretty cool that you can do this on the fly. Speaking of on the fly, another thing that Odin Tools will do is add extra tiles that you can use in the top menu. So if we swipe down from the top and we click on that little pencil icon, now if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see there are two different Odin Tools tiles. Now we can press on these and then drag these up towards the top and we'll have easy access to these options. Now if we want to change out the controller style, all we have to do is just swipe down from the top and then tap on that. And we can do the same thing with swapping out the L2 and R2 mode. Now bear in mind that Retroid might actually just incorporate this into a future update. So if you already see it on your Retroid device, then you don't have to use Odin tools. But for now, this is a really great solution to make things a little bit more streamlined. Okay, now we're ready to start adding our game and BIOS files. And as a quick disclaimer here, you know, all this stuff is copyrighted, so I'm not going to show you where to find games or BIOS files. You're going to be on your own to do that. And I also assume you're going to be using a micro SD card for this part of the process, so let's start from there. Now, the first thing I recommend doing is actually putting the micro SD card directly into the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro. Now, if we swipe down from the top and then scroll up just a little bit, you'll see there's a notification for the SD card. It may ask you to reformat the card, and if you do, then do it in portable storage. For me, it didn't ask, it just asked how I want to open it. So I'm just going to open it up with the regular files app. And now when we look at the card, you can see there's a bunch of different folders, alarms, Android, audiobooks, and so on. And these folders just get auto-populated when you plug it into an Android device. Either way, once we plugged it in and we're not getting any sort of errors with the card, let's go ahead and open up the side menu and then eject it. Now we're ready to plug it into our computer. Now looking at the folder system, you can see all the different folders that we just saw on the device. Next, we're going to make one additional folder and we're going to call it games. And as you've probably guessed, this is where we're going to put our BIOS and games files. So within that games folder, go ahead and make a folder for all the different gaming systems that you want to play on the Odin 2. I know it's a little bit tedious to set all this up, but you only have to do it one time. Anyway, here's a look at all of the systems that I'm going to add to mine. And I'm sure I probably forgot one or two here and there. Now, if you're brand new to emulation, you might be wondering, where do I get these game files to actually put in here? And the thing is, the game and BIOS files are all copyrighted, so I'm not going to show you at all where to find them. So you're going to be on your own to populate these folders. That's just kind of how it goes. However, I will say that I did make a section within my written guide that will kind of help guide the way. For example, the BIOS files are usually one of the hardest things to figure out. And so in my guide, I've listed out the most common BIOS files you're going to need. And I've also put the names of them here, so a little bit of searching will help you find these files, but I'm not going to link them directly. Anyway, this section is going to be pretty short. You just want to drag over all your game files from wherever you have them stored onto that micro SD card. 
So as an example here on the right side is going to be my computer files. And I'm gonna go into the 3DS section and I have a list of my ROM library. And I'm gonna pick out my favorite 3DS games and then drag them over into the 3DS folder on my micro SD card. And that's really about it. It's just kind of a rinse and repeat section. Even though this section is kind of short in the video, it's probably gonna be the longest one in your actual setup process. Anyway, once you've moved over all of those files and you're good to go, then it's time to eject the SD card and put it back into our device. And now we're ready for the fifth step in our process, which is gonna to be to configure the emulators. And like I mentioned, this is gonna be the longest part of the video, but I will have each system timestamp down below. And so if you kind of want to take this one byte at a time, you can pick a certain system, set that one up, and then move on to the next one, and so on. If this is your first time setting up Android emulators, then it might take some time, but the more you practice, the easier it'll get. Anyway, let's go ahead and start with the most fundamental of all the different apps, and that one is RetroArch. This one's important because it has many different systems within one. All of your classic systems, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, all that, will be played within RetroArch. So let's go ahead and open it up. It's going to ask a couple different permissions things. Go ahead and allow all of it. And then it'll take a moment to extract the base APK. Once that's done, we're going to change out the look and feel of the emulator. And to do that, we're going to go into the settings options and then user interface and then menu. And from here, we're going to change it from the default GLUI to XMB. And now to switch the interface over, we just need to close out of the app and then open it back up. And this interface is very similar to what you remember probably from a PSP or a PlayStation 3. And I think it just works a lot better when it comes to tutorials. Okay, so first thing we want to do on the left main menu is we want to go down to Online Updater. And the first option will be Core Downloader. And within here, we want to download and install all the different cores or emulators for each of the systems we want to play. And as you can imagine, in my written guide, I have a full list of each of the ones that I recommend for most of the major systems. So I'm not going to bore you through actually downloading each of these, but I'll have that listed in my written guide. Anyway, once that's done, let's go down the line and download some other options here within the online updater. For example, I recommend updating everything starting with update core info files and below. So just go through each of these and click on them and it'll download and then extract it and you'll be good to go. Next, we're going to go over one tab to the settings tab. And here we're going to make a bunch of changes. We're going to start with the input section. Under Retropad Binds, you'll find the Port 1 controls. And even though they're already automatically mapped, I recommend going in and manually mapping each one of these. This is going to ensure that every single game is going to work properly. So for each of these, go ahead and tap on them and then press the corresponding button. And again, it's a little bit tedious, but you only have to do this one time. After that, we're going to back out to the main inputs menu. And then there's the section called Hotkeys. This is one of the most important. Now, in my written guide, I'm going to have a bunch of different diagrams with my recommended controller configurations for certain systems. And what you're seeing right now is the listing for RetroArch. And these specifically are going to be for all the different hotkeys. Hello, it's me again. So we're going to talk a little bit about hotkeys real quick because in the Odin guide, which is still the footage that we're using here, I use the select button as the hotkey enable button, which is the typical one that you would use for most handhelds. However, on the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro, the select and start are right next to each other and it's on the right side. And so that does make it a little bit awkward to use as your hotkey enable. What I recommend doing for Retroid Pocket devices is to use the L3 button for hotkey enable instead. That means you'll press down on L3 plus another button to actually do the hotkeys in RetroArch and in a couple other apps like DuckStation and AetherSX2. So in this video, you're still going to hear a couple times where I mentioned select plus something else. But what I really mean is L3. And I'll use a little voiceover thing just to kind of make it funny as well. But I did want to point out why it's going to be a little bit different in that we're not going to use select plus another one. We're going to use L3 just because it makes a lot more sense from an ergonomic standpoint. And if you're not familiar with this option, essentially what you do is you set a hotkey enable button, which for us is going to be the L3 button. And then you can set up all the other hotkeys and they're only going to work if you also press the hotkey enable button. So for example, to quit out of a game, you're going to hold on to L3 and then press the start button. And if you ever get confused about the RetroArch process, which honestly is pretty easy because it's very complex, I've actually made a full RetroArch starter guide. So I would recommend checking that out if you do have further questions. Anyway, back to the hotkeys, let's go ahead and set up a couple so you know what I'm talking about. Number one, under hotkey enable, we're going to press the L3 button. And then for the others, we're going to go and press the corresponding button from the diagram. So for menu toggle, it's going to be the X button. And for quit, it's going to be the start button. And then so on and so forth. Fast forward toggle is going to be R2. And you're probably getting the hang of it right now. Either way, just consult the website and the diagram and you should be good to go. Okay, and finally, once you set up the hotkeys while we're still in the input menu, I recommend going down to the confirm quit option. And by default, you'll have to press L3 and start two times in order to quit. I personally don't like that. I like to press it just once. So I'm going to turn this option off. Okay, next, we're going to go up to the user interface options. 
And within here, under on-screen display, we're going to choose on-screen overlay. And by default on Android, RetroArch is going to show you a bunch of controls on your screen. And what I recommend doing is just turning this off, or you can also use this option, which says hide overlay when controller is connected. Personally, I don't use that one. I just turn the overlay off. Okay, next in the settings menu, we're going to go down to the saving section. And within here, there are two options I like to turn on, auto save state and auto load state. That means when you close out of RetroArch, it's going to save your game. And then when you start that game back up, it's going to go exactly where you were before. After that, we'll go into the achievement settings section. Here, you can add your username and password for retro achievements if you have that set up. But I do recommend turning off hardcore mode, which is going to be on by default. If you leave this on, it's going to disable cheats and rewind and save states. And then finally, under directory, we have one other change to make. We're going to go into the system BIOS section, and then we're going to tap on the parent directory option a couple times until we see our SD card. You'll note the SD card by a combination of letters and numbers. After you tap on that, you'll find your games folder, then go into your BIOS folder. Now select use this directory so RetroArch knows where to look for your BIOS files. And that's a real quick down and dirty way of configuring RetroArch for the Retro Pocket 4 Pro. We'll go into the main menu, configuration file, save current configuration, and then quit out of RetroArch. All right, after RetroArch, it's all downhill from here. Everything else is a lot more intuitive. However, there are a lot of apps that we need to configure, and so we're going to do these one by one. And like I mentioned, these are all going to be timestamps, so if you need to come back to these later, it's going to be pretty easy. So let's go ahead and start with the DuckStation PS1 emulator. And the setup for this one is probably one of the easiest. When you first start it up, it'll give you a couple tabs to go through. And under the settings tab, I recommend changing the resolution scale to a 5x resolution. Hello, it's me again. I think this is the last time I'm going to interrupt myself. So I did want to mention that in the rest of the like emulation configuration parts, I'm going to mention that you're going to upscale to a 1080p resolution. That's because the Odin 2 has a 1080p screen. However, the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro resolution is only 750p. So for the most part, depending on the emulator, it's actually in your best interest to do a 720p. 20p upscale instead. So for example, with DuckStation, which we're talking about right now, I set a 5x resolution. That's because that's 1080p. But it's really going to be better to do a 3 or a 4x resolution. That way you're not taxing the device so much, and it really can't process all those pixels anyway on a 750p screen. So when it says to upscale and I say 1080p, what I really mean is 720p. And I'll put like big text or something on the screen so it reminds you. But anyway, I didn't think that was going to be worth like making an entirely new video for. Instead, again, Again, I think you were smart enough to figure all this stuff out. So let's go back to the rest of the video. Additionally, if you want to try out widescreen hacks with PS1 games, you can do that. Personally, I don't really like that. But if you are going to use upscaling, then I recommend turning on the PGXP geometry correction. Okay, after that, we need to point the app to our BIOS files. So we're going to tap on the import BIOS option, which will take us to our file explorer. And next, we'll go into our SD card and into the games folder, and then into our BIOS folder. And these right here are the PS1 BIOS files that I'm using, so I'm going to select those. And again, the names of each of these BIOS files will be found in my written guide. Anyway, once we select it, it's going to say that it's been imported. And so I'm going to pick my region, which is going to be the United States, and then I'm going to choose my BIOS file. After that, we need to select our game directory. So we'll tap on the plus button, then we'll go into our games folder, then our PS1 folder, and then select use this folder. And if all goes well, you should now have all of your games and your BIOS files loaded up. The last thing we need to do is set up our controller profile. So we're going to go into the side menu in the controller settings, and then under port 1, we're going to select perform automatic mapping. From there, you can find our Retro Pocket 4 Pro controller. It's going to say Xbox Wireless Controller if you set it up for an Xbox button layout. So that's what I'm going to select here. And that's it. It'll map all the main buttons already for you. However, there are also some hotkeys you can set up within DuckStation. And just like with RetroArch, I've set up a diagram for this. And thankfully, the PS1 and PS2 emulators, we use the same kind of format. So we have the exact same diagram. And it's very similar to RetroArch. We're going to have our hotkey enable button as L3. And then all the other hotkey combinations. So let me give you an example. Under toggle fast forward, I'm going to tap on it, and then I'm going to press L3 and R2. And it's as simple as that. You can just go through the other hotkeys and set them as you wish. For example, with the open pause menu, I like to do L3 and the X button. But also bear in mind that the back button will do the same thing. Okay, and finally, the last thing within the controller settings is to go into the touchscreen tab. Within here, you'll find an option that says Auto Hide Touchscreen Controller. Go ahead and turn that one on, and then you won't see those on-screen controls when you start up a game. And that's really about it for Duck Station. So if we go back to the games list, I can tap on a game. It's going to start up. I can press select and fast forward. It'll go into fast forward. And yeah, we are now good to go. Okay, next up, we're going to do the Moopin 64 Plus emulator for Nintendo 64. Same thing here. When you start it up, it's going to ask for a couple permissions. And then first thing, we want to press that plus button on the bottom right. 
and then choose Select Folder and then navigate through our Games card in order to find our Games folder, Nintendo 64 folder, and then our games. And this is going to be the same process for each of these emulators, which is why I'm kind of breezing through it. Anyway, for this one, it's going to scan and scrape all of your games. And there we go. Now, there are a couple settings I do recommend changing. So we'll go into the side menu and then Settings. And then under display, we're going to change the rendered resolution. And this we're going to upscale to a 1080p. And then also if you prefer to see your frames per second, you can go into frame rate and then choose which corner you want it to show. Now, thankfully, this app is pretty well pre-configured, so we don't have to do a lot of other changes. But I do recommend setting up the controller. So for this, we're going to go into profiles, then controller, and then tap on the new button up top. Here, we need to name it whatever we want. I'm going to call mine Retro Ed Pocket 4 Pro. And then you'll see a list of all the buttons so that you can map them. Now, just like with the others, I do have a diagram for the Nintendo 64. And I think some of this is going to be intuitive. If you look at the Nintendo 64 controller on the top right, compared to the Retro Ed Pocket 4 Pro and the buttons I've chosen. Of note is going to be the Z button. I actually have that mapped to three different sections. I like to use this with L2, R2, and one of the face buttons as well. And that's because the Z button did a lot of different functions depending on the games you were playing on the Nintendo 64. And this just gives you a lot of room to work with, so depending on what's most comfortable, you can use that. Other than that, the other thing worth noting is that the C buttons are going to be mapped to the right analog stick. Okay, and so you can go through here and map all of those buttons. Like I mentioned with the Z button, you can map it three different times. And that's really about it. Now, once you're done, you will see that the Retro Ed Pocket 4 Pro is a controller profile. And now we need to set this as our default profile. And so we're going to go back to the profile section within the sidebar and then tap on Select Profile. From there, find the Controller 1 profile and then change it to Retro Ed Pocket 4 Pro. You can also change out your emulation profile, but I found that the default one called Glide 64 Accurate actually works really well. But if you do run into any game that doesn't run perfectly, this is what I would recommend changing up. And so yeah, there we go. We have now set up Nintendo 64. Let's move on to the next one. And we're going to move over to Sega Saturn with the Yabasan Shiro 2 emulator. When you first start it up, it's going to ask if you want to sign in to an online profile. I always choose no. And then we'll go into the settings and tap on Select Game Directory. Here, I like to delete the ones that are already there and then add our own. And as you can imagine, we're going to navigate to our micro SD card and the games folder and then Sega Saturn. Next, while we're in the settings, there's a couple other things I recommend changing. For example, you can turn on frames per second if you'd like. Additionally, there's a rendering resolution option, and by default, it's going to be native, which is going to be 1080p with this screen. But if you'd like to have something a little bit more chunky, you can go to Original or 2X. Finally, under Player 1 Input Device, we're going to select Choose, and then we're going to select our Xbox Wireless Controller. Then after that, we need to map the buttons, and just as a quick refresher, here is the diagram. Now this one's unique. If you think about the six-button layout of the Sega Saturn controller on the top right, we're going to map it as close as we can to that experience. So for the ABC buttons, we're going to map them in a row, as you can see on the Retro Ed Pocket 4 Pro. And then for X, Y, Z, we're going to map them to the top. So X is going to be L1, then Y is going to be the top button, and then Z will be R1. I know it's a little bit odd to kind of have a button layout like this, but it's the way that I'm able to make my brain work. And then of course you can see the menu button is going to be mapped to the select button for me. Anyway, from here you can select edit key map and then plug in all of these controls. And that's it. Once you back out of the settings, you should see a listing of all of your games that you have loaded up and then you can select them to run. Okay, next let's move over to Sega Dreamcast with the ReDream emulator. Now, like I mentioned before, this is a free app, but you can upgrade it in app. And because I've already paid for that many years ago, I can just tap on the upgrade to premium, and then it's going to check my Google account and verify that I've purchased it already. And now we're good to go. I've unlocked it yet again. Okay, first thing we want to go into the library section and select add directory. And then we'll navigate to our Dreamcast folder and then select Use This Folder. Now if we go into the Games tab, you can see that all of my Dreamcast games are now showing up. Next, let's go ahead and map our controls, and this is super easy. We're going to go into Input, and then under Port A, we're going to change the input device to the Xbox Wireless Controller. Now for the most part, all of these buttons will be mapped correctly right then and there. However, I do like to make a couple changes to the shortcuts. For example, the Turbo or Fast Forward button, I like to map this one to the R3 button, and so I'm just going to go in and change that. In addition, for the Exit Emulator button, I like to use L3. Just note that when you map that, it'll often exit the emulator at the same time. If you go back into ReDream, you can see that it's all mapped correctly. Next, we'll go into the Video tab, and here we can upscale the resolution. Now, there isn't a great resolution that's going to fill out a full 1080p. Instead, you'll see options for both 960p and then 1440p. Also, while we're here, you can also turn on the frame rate counter if you'd like. And really, that's about it when it comes to the settings. Let's go ahead and start up a game. 
Now, first thing you may see is that the game is going to run in a 4x3 aspect ratio, but many of these games have widescreen cheats. So let's press the back button to get into the quick menu, and then under edit cheats, you can see there's a widescreen option. Let's turn that on and then select restart game. And now when we go back into the game, you can see it's filling out the full screen. Now here within the menus, it's actually kind of blowing it out and making it stretched. But when we get into the actual game, you can see that everything is working correctly. We're getting a full widescreen perspective and Sonic is not being squished in any way. So we're good to go with Sega Dreamcast. Let's move on now to PSP. And this one's also pretty easy as well. When you first start it up, it's going to ask you to choose a PSP folder. This is where it's going to store your settings and other configurations. So here we're actually just going to go into the PSP folder and create it there. Next, we're going to go into the main menu. We're going to tap on the SD card icon and then navigate to our PSP folder under games and PSP. Once you're there, click on the plus button so that it turns into a minus. That means that anytime you open up PSP in the future, it's going to go directly to this folder. Next, let's go into the settings, and there's only a couple things we need to change. Number one is rendering resolution. By default, it's going to be 2x, but this thing is so powerful, we can do a 4x or 1080p resolution with no problem. After that, we can scroll all the way down to the bottom, and if you want to see your frames per second and speed, you can choose them here. After that, there's only one other settings to change. We're going to go into controls, and then we want to uncheck the option that says on-screen touch controls. And that's it. We are good to go. We have now set up PSP correctly. Okay, sticking with the theme of handhelds, we're now going to move over to Nintendo. We'll start with Drastic, the Nintendo DS emulator. When you first set it up, it's going to give you a couple prompts. I would usually just confirm all of these, except for installing a desktop app. Now we're going to go into change options. Under the video settings, I like to go into frame skip and turn this off. And then also I like to scroll down a little bit to high resolution 3D rendering and turn this on. This will double the resolution of the games. Next, we're going to go into external controller and then select key mapping and select no mapping. From there, you can go into map control and then it'll ask you to map all your buttons. I'm not going to make a diagram for this because it completely corresponds to the buttons on the retro is pocket for pro in itself. So this is going to be a very intuitive setup. After that, we want to go into Map Special. And there are a couple ones that I do like to map here. For example, Screen Swap, I like to set to L1, and then fast forward to R3. For all the other ones, if you don't want to use them, then you can just select Skip. But I do like for Half Screen Swap to set this to R1. And really, that's about it for Drastic. Other than Disable Map Keys and Overlay, you want to turn this on. We're good to go. We can now go back to the main menu, select Load New Game, and then navigate to our Nintendo DS folder. Once you click on it, you should now see all of your games and you can boot them right up. Okay, next we're going to do Citra, which is the Nintendo 3DS emulator. When you first start it up, you're going to get a bunch of prompts. Just go ahead and agree to all of these. And then it's going to ask to select your user folder. And this is like the PSP emulator where it's going to ask you where you want to put your user data. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to go into our 3DS folder and then make it that one. After that, it's going to ask where are all of your games. And so next, you just want to navigate back to that 3DS folder. And there you are, you should be good to go with all of your 3DS games. So now let's go into the options and make a couple different changes. The first is going to be the gamepad. You need to map all these different buttons. And these correspond directly to the Retro is Pocket 4 Pro gamepad, so it's a very simple setup. Next, we'll go into the graphics section. And Citra is capable of using either OpenGL or Vulkan, but I found that OpenGL will usually give me the best graphics, so I usually will stick with that. So within here, all I usually will change is the asynchronous shader compilation, turning that on, and then I like to adjust my internal resolution. You can go all the way up to a 10x resolution, but I found somewhere between 3 and 4 will usually be the best. So that's it for the settings, let's go ahead and start up a game. And first thing you're going to notice is that we have on-screen controls. Now this you have to actually turn off within the submenu. So we're going to press the back button, and then under Overlay Options, we're going to uncheck the box that says Show Overlay. Also, if you want to see the frames per second, you can turn that one on. Also within here, you can change out your screen layout. I personally like the default one, but if you want two of equal size, you can do side by side. And that's really about it. Now, when it comes to Nintendo 3DS, the longer you play a game, the more shaders will compile, which will make it a lot smoother of a process. So if you first start up a game and it's a little bit laggy, I would just recommend playing it for a few more minutes. Okay, I think we are now ready for the big guns. We're going to start with Dolphin for GameCube and Nintendo Wii. So once you open that up, you're going to have a couple things to confirm. And now we want to add our games. Same process here. We're going to navigate to our SD card, then the GameCube folder, and then select Use This Folder. And we're going to take this one byte at a time. So we'll fully set up GameCube, and then we will set up Wii after that. So first thing we want to do is go into the Settings option, and then under Config and General, there are a couple things I change here. Number one, I turn on Enable Cheats, and then I change my fallback region to NTSCU, and then finally at the bottom, I also enable save states. 
Next, under Configuration, we want to go into the Interface option, and under Use Panic Handlers, we want to turn this off. If you leave this on, it's going to crash with certain games like Paper Mario. And that's it for the Config section, so we're going to go back to the main settings, and now we'll go into Graphic Settings. Under here, we can choose between OpenGL and Vulkan. I found that most games run the best with a change this to Vulkan. Now under Shader Compilation Mode, I like to change this to Hybrid, and then I also like to compile my shaders before starting the game. Next on the bottom, we have a bunch of different other options. We'll start with Enhancements, and under Internal Resolution, I like to change this to a 3x. And then finally at the bottom here, there's the option to turn on Widescreen Hack. Now in general, I like to leave this one off by default. We'll talk more about this in a moment. So let's go back into the graphics settings and go into Hacks. And there's one option here that I do like to turn on, and it's this one here called VBI Skip. Essentially what this means is if you have any slowdown, it's not going to slow down the audio. And depending on the game, it might get a little bit weird, but it also won't give you any audio crackling, which I always hate. Next, under graphic settings, we can go into statistics, and then if you'd like, you can turn on some on-screen notifications like frames per second. Let's go back into the main settings section and go into GameCube input. And this is where we're going to map our controls, and it can get pretty complicated right here. To start, we'll go into GameCube Controller 1 and press the cog wheel. And then under Device, make sure that it's set for the Xbox Wireless Controller. Now you can scroll down and you'll see all the different buttons that you need to map. So let's take a look at my diagram and see what buttons I chose and why. And the most important thing is to look at the A, B, and X, Y layout on the original GameCube controller. Now obviously we can't make a setup where the A button is in the center like that, but I have found that putting the A button on the bottom and then the B button on the left seems to make the most sense. On top of that, I like to use the analog triggers with L2 and R2, and then the Z button is going to be R1. Now things will get tricky when you get to the trigger section, because there's multiple options. But essentially all you want to do is just press L2 and R2 for each of these. So for both L and L analog, you want to press L2. And of course, same thing with the R2 button. Okay, so really that's it when it comes to the default settings for Nintendo GameCube. However, one thing to note is you can do per game configurations with this app. To do that, you want to pick a game and then long press on it. And now you have specific settings that you can set for that game alone. For example, if there's a game that runs better with Vulkan than OpenGL, this is where you would change it. Now let's talk about a couple other tweaks that are going to be specific to certain games on these Retroid devices. The first is going to be F-Zero GX. We're going to long press on this and then select Edit Game Settings. And now under Config and then General, you want to make sure that Dual Core is turned on. It might actually look like it's turned on by default, but what you want to do is toggle it off and then toggle it back on. For some reason, this game has to be manually configured to turn on the Dual Core so that you can get full performance. And that's it, you only have to do that one time. Now another game I would recommend checking out is going to be Twilight Princess. For this one, we're going to long press and then now select Edit Cheats. And here under the Patches setting, you'll see one that says Hyrule Field Speed Hack. And this one you want to turn on to make sure that when you're in the overworld, everything's going to run nice and smoothly. Now let's go ahead and start up a game and you can see there are onboard controls, so let's turn those off. We're going to press the back button to get into the side menu, and then we'll scroll down to Overlay Controls. Here, choose Toggle Controls, and then on the bottom, choose Toggle All. That's going to turn all of them off. And there we are, we are now good to go. However, as you're playing the game, you might be thinking to yourself, I wonder if this can be played in widescreen. And it just so happens that Mario Kart Double Dash can. And this is where we're going to set up a per-game configuration with the widescreen hack. So back in the main menu, we're going to long press on Mario Kart, and then select Edit Game Settings. Now we'll go into Graphics Settings, and then scroll down to Enhancements, and then scroll down there until we get to Widescreen Hack. We're going to turn that one on and then go back into the Graphics Settings section. And then at the top, you'll see Aspect Ratio. For this, we need to set it to 4 16 by 9. And that's it. We can now back out. and We've made a per-game configuration change for Mario Kart Double Dash. And now when we open up that game, yes, we have a widescreen hack that works perfectly. Now, not every single game is going to work with widescreen hacks on GameCube. In fact, for the most part, I prefer to play them in 4x3, and then every once in a while there will be a good one like this. But there are also some games that natively supported 16x9, and F-Zero GX is a great example. For this one, we don't have to do anything within Dolphin, we do it within the game settings. So we'll go into Options, then Screen Mode, and then change it to widescreen. From there, we can save our changes, and now natively, it's gonna run in 16 by nine. And there's not a lot of games that will do this, but this one does, and same thing with Soul Calibur 2. Okay, so that's it for Nintendo GameCube. Let's now move over to Nintendo Wii. And thankfully, a lot of these configurations are gonna be the same other than the inputs. Let's start by adding our Wii game. So we're gonna go into the Wii tab, and then same process here, we're gonna navigate to our Wii folder and then select it. And there we go, we are now seeing our four Wii games. 
Now let's go into settings and then Wii input. And then under Wii Remote 1, we'll click on the cog tile. Now this will have a couple different options, starting with the Wii Remote. And now's a good time to bring up our diagram. Now this one is kind of tricky and unintuitive, so I'll walk you through it. Number one most important thing is to think about the Wiimote and the nunchuck themselves, and how each of those buttons were laid out. So if we look at the A and B on the Wiimote, the A is going to be that top confirm button, and then the B is our trigger button underneath. So for these I like to set the A as the face button bottom, and then B as the one to the left. Then also remember that we have the one and two buttons further down the Wiimote. For these, I like to use them as the top and the rightmost buttons. On top of that, we will configure the IR sensor within the movement to be the right analog stick. Now on the left side, we need to think about the nunchuck, because that's what you usually would hold with your left hand. And so for this, I made the C button the L1, then the Z button the L2, and then our nunchuck movement will be the left analog stick. However, depending on how you're playing, you may prefer to have the C and Z buttons be on the right side instead, so you can always swap them over if you'd like. The final thing that I always like to set up is going to be a motion of shake. And this will be under the X, Y, and Z axes for both the Wiimote and the nunchuck. And these I usually will map to the R1 button. So what this means, if I press R1 while playing a Wii game, it's going to simulate that I'm shaking the Wiimote and the nunchuck at the same time. And this is important in certain games, like New Super Mario Bros. U, as well as Donkey Kong Country Returns. So first thing you want to do under the Wii Mote section is you want to set all of those buttons that we just talked about. And then also under Motion Simulation, this is where you're going to set the analog stick as well as those shake buttons with R1. After that, we'll go into the Extension section, which is already going to be set up for Nunchuck. And here we want to set all of our left controls, so C and Z buttons. And same thing with the left analog stick. Also within here, you can map all of the shake functions to the R1 button again. And that's really it when it comes to setting up the Wiimote and Nunchuck. It's all about looking at the diagram and configuring the buttons to correspond to it. Now once we're done, we want to set up a profile specifically for this one setup. So under the main controls section, we're going to go into profiles and then tap on the disk icon. It's going to ask us to name that new profile and I'm going to call it Wiimote with Nunchuck. Now after that, we can set up a couple other profiles. And the easiest one is going to be just the Wii mode itself without a nunchuck. So we'll click on extension and then select none. Now we'll go back up to that profile section and then press the save icon again. And we're going to set it to Wii mode only. And finally, one other configuration I recommend setting up is going back to the extension and now selecting the classic controller. Now this one had a very standard layout, so I don't have a diagram for it. But the buttons here are going to correspond to the retro and pocket for pro. So it's pretty simple. And again, we want to save this as its own profile. We're going to click on the save icon and then name it Classic Controller. And there we go. We now have all of our inputs set up. And so depending on the game that we're using, we can choose the controller profile that matches it. So for example, with Super Paper Mario, this one only used the Wiimote. So we're going to long press on the game, select Edit Game Settings, and then go under Wii Input, Wii Remote, and then we can choose our profile. And we're going to do Wii Remote only. And that's it. You just kind of rinse and repeat for each of the Wii games, and that's how you set up those controls. All right, next up, we're going to go into Aether SX2 for PlayStation 2 emulation. And the settings is going to be very similar to how it was when we set up Duck Station. On that front page, we want to keep it at optimal or safe defaults. And then under GPU renderer, change this to Vulcan. Next, under upscale multiplier, I like to set this to 2.5, which is going to be just a little bit more than 1080p. On the next page, it's going to ask you to import the BIOS file. Again, we're going to click on that, go and navigate to our BIOS folder, and then choose our PS2 BIOS. It's going to be the largest file among the ones that I recommend. It's going to have a .bin file extension. So you can click on that, it's going to find it, and then you can choose that as your BIOS. Next, we'll select our game directory. Again, navigate to the card in the PS2 folder. And that's it, the setup is complete. It's going to scan the folder and then pick all of your games. And like I mentioned, it's going to be very similar to Duck Station. So first, we'll go into the app settings and make a couple changes. Number one is the fast boot option. If you'd like to see the PS2 boot logo, you can turn that off. However, just bear in mind, if you try to play a game that isn't from the same region as your BIOS, it's not going to work. So I recommend keeping this one on for fast boot. Now further down, you can see the on-screen display option. So if you want to see the frames per second, this is where you will enable it. And now let's move over to the system tab. If you ever have to do any sort of underclocking because of performance issues, this is where you would do it. However, at the bottom of the system option, there's a turbo speed. And I prefer to change this from 200% to 300%. This means our fast forward is going to work even faster. Now under graphics options, scroll down until you find the widescreen patches. And then same thing with the interlacing patches. I like to turn both of these two on. And that's really about it. Under the settings, we can go all the way over to the achievements section. And here we can enable retro achievements and then also sign in. Next, we're going to set up our controls. 
So we'll go back into the side menu and then select controller settings. And then under controller port one, we'll do automatic mapping and then Xbox wireless controller. And then also go over to the touchscreen tab and make sure you turn on the one that says hide with external controller. Finally, on the far right, you will have our hotkeys option. And this is gonna be very similar to how we just explained it with duck station. Here's the diagram. So we'll use L3 as our hotkey enable and then we'll press all the other corresponding buttons depending on what we're trying to do. Now, one thing of note about Aether SX2 is that it's an older version of the app. And what happened is the newer version on the Play Store option is owned by a different developer. And that one has ads and a bunch of other regressions within the emulator. So what we wanna do is prevent it from updating. Let me show you how to do that. We're gonna click on Google Play front page and then our account icon, and then scroll down until you find the section that says settings. Within here, go into network preferences and then auto update apps. And for this, I recommend changing it to don't auto update apps. Now, if you go into your manage apps section within the Play Store, if you look at our details, we can see that Aether SX2 update is there, but it won't update unless we choose to update. Now, this does mean you'll have to manually update all of your other apps within the Play Store, but at the very least, it'll keep the Aether SX2 without being touched. And there are also other options like Neither SX2, which is an alternative version of this, and I'll have links to that in my written guide. That's a bit of a more advanced feature. Now, earlier in the video, I talked about two different versions of Aether SX2. There's the Alpha 4248 version that you can get from their website, and then there's the 3668 version that you can get from archive.org. Now, in general, I actually recommend using the Alpha 4248 version, and if you also install the latest Neither SX2 patch, it's also going to come with the 4248 version. And I found that this one tends to work the best with most games. Some games won't work well with the older version, but this one, the alpha build, will work well. So for me personally, that's the version of the app that I used. It's also the version that I tested with when I made my Retroid Pocket 4 Pro review. Now that being said, there are some games that mysteriously just don't work well with this version, and no one's really been able to figure it out. A great example is going to be Sly Cooper. In my Retroid Pocket 4 Pro review, I show this as being unplayable. In fact, when you use just the general Vulcan back and it only runs at about 10 frames per second or about 15% speed. One trick that you can do is you can go into these settings and then change it to the software renderer. This will improve performance, but it's still not at 100%. Instead, it's now running at about 45 frames per second. It definitely has some slowdown. Now, the crazy thing is, if you use the 3668 version of this app, it's actually going to run at full speed, no problem, even at a 1.75 resolution. And so in particular, if you're trying to play these Sly Cooper games, then I would recommend using this version of the app. Now, unfortunately, it's not as simple as just installing both of these at the same time and then toggling between the two depending on the game. As it stands right now, you can only install one version of Aether SX2 at a time. And so unfortunately, it is kind of a pain in the butt that we just don't have a solution for right now. In general, I do recommend using the 4248 version, but if you are trying to play a specific game, you might want to try this one instead. Another thing to note is that with every Retroid Pocket device, there is a game compatibility sheet. And these are all going to be Google documents that allow you to go through each of the different systems and then see specifically which games work the best. And I've got links to each of these in my written guide, but let's look at the Retroid Pocket 4 Pro one. If we go into the PlayStation 2 tab, you can see that there's a bunch of instructions here near the top just to give you the best performance. And then as you scroll down, you'll see a bunch of different games and how they each play, at least in initial testing. So if you are looking to get the best performance possible with some of these games and they're not really running that great, I would recommend checking out the corresponding compatibility sheet. Okay, we're almost done. We are at the finish line. One more emulator to finish, that's gonna be Yuzu. This is gonna be our Nintendo Switch emulator. When you open this up, you're gonna have a bunch of notification things that you need to accept. And to be honest, this is very similar to the Citra emulator setup process, so it's kind of intuitive. When you get to the keys section, it's gonna ask you for your prod.keys file. Again, this is copyrighted, but I have mine within my BIOS folder. So I'm gonna to navigate to there and then choose it. Next, it's gonna ask where your games are stored. So you're gonna to go to add games and then navigate to your Switch folder. And there we go, we now have all of our games loaded up. Let's go into the settings and make a couple key changes. First, we'll go into advanced settings. And then under system, you have the option of changing between docked or handheld mode. And I found that it's gonna be very rare when a game plays on the Retroid Pocket 4 or 4 Pro when in docked mode. So in general, I would just recommend keeping this one off. The only other thing I recommend checking out in the advanced settings is going to be in the graphics section. If you scroll down to near the bottom, there's an option that says use asynchronous shaders. I would recommend turning this one on because it will improve your gameplay performance overall. 
Another section worth noting is the Manage User Data section. And here you can do all sorts of things. You can install specific firmware, and you can also install game updates and DLC, or you can import save games if you have them from like a desktop version of Yuzu. Anyway, those are more advanced topics, so let's actually get into the game. And when we start up a game, you're going to see that there are on-screen controls. So this is easy to get rid of. We're going to press the back button on the Odin. And then under overlay options, we can turn on our frames per second. And then also we can choose toggle controls. Here we're going to select toggle all and then press OK. And now all the on-screen controls are off. Now I would say among all of these systems that we're talking about in this video, Nintendo Switch on the Yuzu or even the Skyline emulator are probably going to run the worst. Even when trying to play a lightweight game like Guacamelee, you can see that it's not getting a full 60 frames per second in the top left corner. And there's a few reasons for it, but number one is the fact that the Yuzu emulator, at least as of making this video, is tailored more towards Snapdragon devices. And because the Retroid Pocket devices don't use Snapdragon processors, we are at a disadvantage. And so unfortunately, at least at least as of right now, Nintendo Switch performance is really only going to work on very lightweight games. Hopefully in the future we'll see some graphics drivers updates, but as it stands right now, it's not the best. Okay, congratulations, we have now made it through the longest and hardest part of this whole setup guide. Anyway, let's move on to the last step of the process, which is to set up a front end. This is going to be the user experience that's going to bring it all together. And like I mentioned previously, we're going to use the Daidisho app. Not only does it work well, but it's completely free. Once you open it up, it's going to ask you to download platforms. Essentially here, you're just going to identify all the different systems you want to play within Daijisho. So obviously this will be a matter of choice to pick whatever system you want to play. Just bear in mind that for each system you choose, it needs to either have an emulator or it needs to have the emulator core downloaded within RetroArch. Anyway, once that's all set up, you can now tap through by pressing L1 and R1, and you should be able to see all the different systems. Now, nothing's loaded up just yet, but let's go ahead and make it a little bit prettier. So we're going to go over to the settings section, and you can see up top we have access to our Android settings. Everything underneath that is going to be Daijisho settings. So let's go into the appearance section, and then under download platform wallpapers pack, you can choose different themes to download and play with Daijisho. One of my favorites is called Pop, that's the one that I showed in the intro of this video. So we're going to choose that and select download pack and then confirm. Once that's done, if we go back to the platforms tab, you can now see we have this really nice design right here. But it's not quite perfect. I think it's just a little bit too bright. So let's go back into appearance. And then under dark theme, we're going to change it from follow system to dark. And yeah, I think this looks a lot better on the platforms tab. Everything looks a little bit sharper and clearer. Next, let's go down to the navigation section. To start, I want to change our home page. By default, it's going to go to the widgets tab. But because we're using this mostly for emulation, I prefer to make the homepage platforms. Now also we want to set up our hotkeys. This is going to allow us to tab between the different tabs and the systems. So under tabs hotkeys, I like to use L2 and R2. And then by pressing those, it'll go through the different tabs up top. Now under the switching hotkeys, I change those to L1 and R1. This means that when you get to a specific tab like platforms, when you press L1 and R1, it's going to tab through the different platforms. So that's a very quick way of setting up Daijisho in terms of navigation and appearance. Now I'm going to show you how to add our emulators. We'll start with Game Boy Advance because this one has a couple hiccups I want to walk you through. Now first things first, we need to point it to our games folder. So we're going to click on Paths and then Add More. And then you guessed it, we're going to navigate through to the Games folder and then Game Boy Advance and then select Use This Folder. Once that's done, I'm going to press the Sync button. That's going to scrub through all the different games and then also download all their box art. This will take a couple minutes depending on the size of your library. Once it's done, we can go into the library and you can see here that we have a listing of all of our games. So let's go ahead and start one up. And the first thing you'll see when starting up any RetroArch game is this Killing Package Processes pop-up. So I'm going to show you how to get rid of this. We're going to go back to the Settings tab, and then under Library, we're going to scroll down until we find the Disable Player's Warnings. After you turn this on, you won't see that warning anymore. So now let's go back to that game and start it up. And chances are you're probably just going to see a black screen. And that's because by default, Daijisho is trying to start a certain RetroArch core, but it's not the one I downloaded. If you look at my written guide, I recommend the MGBA Emulator Core. So just go ahead and press the back button a couple times. It's going to ask you to kill the app. And now we'll go back to the front Game Boy Advance page and then click on the pencil icon on the bottom right. Now scroll down until you find the player settings. And you can see here the default core that they chose is VBA Next. We're going to click on the arrow and then scroll down to around the 62 number. That's going to be where all the Game Boy Advance games are. And if you look, number 61 is RetroArch 64-bit and the MGBA core. That's the one we need. So we're going to change it to that one and then select Save on the bottom right. Now if we go back into the library and choose our game, yeah, the game pops right up. 
So that's all you have to do, and you only have to do it that one time for Game Boy Advance. Let's try another system that's going to be a little bit easier. We'll start with Nintendo GameCube. Same process here, we're going to click on Paths, and then navigate to our SD card in the GameCube folder, then use this folder. After that, we'll press the Sync button, it's going to scrub and then scrape all of our box art. And once that's done, we can go into the library and then choose a game. And then when we click on it, by default, it's going to use the Dolphin emulator that we already set up. And just like that, we're now playing Mario Golf. So no extra configuration needed there. Let's try another one with Nintendo 64. We're going to go on Paths, then Add More, then Games, and then Nintendo 64, and then use this folder. After we're done syncing it so that all of the games are scrubbed and scraped, we can go into Library and then choose our game. And thankfully, by default, this one will also choose the Mupin64 emulator by default. So all that previous configuration that we did is now working within Daijisho. And that's it, you basically just want to go through and do that for all of your different systems. Now some of these are not going to work perfectly. We'll start with Sega Saturn. By default, it's going to try to use the standalone Yabasan Shiro emulator, and unfortunately that is currently not working with Daijisho. However, if we go into the settings within Saturn, and then we change the default player from the standalone emulator to something else, for example the RetroArch core of Yabasan Shiro, now when we try to start up a game it will actually run. So it'll be up to you which emulator you want to use in this kind of situation. Anyway, that's really about it when it comes to setting up Daijisho. It's just kind of a tedious process in that you have to do it for every single system one at a time. But once you have it all synced up, it's a pretty nice user interface. Now the next thing, you may be wanting this to be your home screen so that when you start up the device, it goes right into Daijisho. So let me show you how to do that. We're going to go into the Settings tab and then open up the Android Settings. Now we'll select Search Settings and type in the word Home. You'll see an option for Default Home App. We're going to change that to Daijisho. And that's it, from now on, anytime you start up the game, it's going to default to going to Daijisho as your homepage. And there's a lot of great things with Daijisho that I'm not going to talk about in this video, but I have a whole dedicated video about it. And of course, it'll be linked in my written guide down below. Anyway, that's really about it for this video. This is officially the longest Retro Game Core video I've ever made before. Although, to be fair, my other Retroid Pocket guides are pretty long, but I've broken them up into different chunks. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this really long, one comprehensive video to get you set up with your Retroid Pocket device. And I hope you learned a few things along the way, and that little robot voice that I was using wasn't too annoying. I hope you found it funny. And if you have any other questions, let me know in the comments down below, but then also make sure you check out that written guide, because I like to keep those up to date. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming!